my name is Craig Bay, and this is my project on CN Tower. And um, what I researched in in my project was the reasons why the tower was built, and how it was built, and what kind of elements it can withstand, like lightning, fire, earthquakes, lightning. Um, I have my own pictures on the doors of my project, of my own experience. I have merchandise such as a t-shirt and postcards. And I, my, my cover page is a drawing I made. And I have 30 pages of information. And uh, basically I just studied the architecture and reasons for the building and uh, reasons like it's a telecommunications hub, which is why they built it in the first place. And I learned all the levels that were on it. And uh, I also had a model that I don't have here right now, a silver model of the CN Tower. Can you please? Okay, go ahead. And on the computer here, I have a virtual tour of the CN Tower, where you can browse through pictures and take your own little tour if you haven't been there already. <laughs> And a calculator, which shows the height and weight. You, you put in your height and weight, and it'll tell you how many of you it takes to be as heavy and as tall as the CN Tower. And in my research, I figured out the exact height of the tower, all the levels that are in the CN Tower, and the other towers in comparison with heights. And that, that's basically what I did for my project. And I feel it's part of our heritage because it's, it's pride for Canada having the world's tallest building and freestanding structure right in our country and because we built it. Pictures here. Go ahead. Okay, well, my project is called Motiva Agus Matahan. It means as it was and as it is. I did it on St. Avex and the history about it. Uh, St. Avex originated in Anishat. It was a small college run by the diocese. Then they transferred to Antigonish and called it St. Avex, where they had a larger university. They had about 60 students and 25 faculty. They only had about nine buildings and nine starting subjects. There's some different rules that they had, such as uh, you weren't allowed alcohol on the premises. If you were, you'd be expelled with shame. <laughs> and uh, you weren't allowed musical instruments or radios. Uh, you had to be up at 7.35 on Sunday. And uh, Monday to Saturday, you had to be up at 6.35. You'd have to say Mass or say all your prayers and get ready for classes. You'd have to have your lights out by 10.35. The person who founded it was uh, Bishop McKinnon. He appointed the first uh, rector, which was John Cameron. Uh, I have some things. Sure. Okay, well, I did a little bit of history on my granduncle. He went to Santa Vex in 1936, mm -hmm. and he graduated with his history and languages. He became the Dean of Arts, the Dean of Students, Director of Alumni, and then President for eight years. Uh, these are just some of the, do you want me to? Sure. These are some of the things he had. To make some extra money around college, he had to order a bicycle and bike around and sell the casket all along Cape Breton. And this is his order form. This is a 1937. It was a five-speed bike. Uh, it shows how much he paid right there. Um, he uh, joined the military in the summer, and to be a certified Canadian, he needed a letter to prove it. So St. Vex wrote him a letter, and that's the letter that they had. Um, that's the St. Vex song. That's his timetable. And uh, that's the classroom directory. That's his second year timetable, and that's his handwritten timetable. Uh, 
upset. Do you want me to? Okay, go ahead. I'm Carolyn Reist, and this is my project on Sable Islands, and my title is Graveyard of the Atlantic. I did this project because I wanted to learn more about Sable Island, and my partner Lacey's not here today, but I'll do her parts. This is Sable Island. And since 1583, there have been a hundred, uh, there have been 350 uh, shipwrecks all over the island. Uh, once the, if there was a shipwreck, then the people, the survivors, would come onto the island, and there'd be a house of refuges all over the island. And people could go in there when there's the storm, and they would find food and water and heat. And once the storm was over, the people in the life-saving life -saving stations would go around and make patrols to see if there was any wrecks. And they would find the people and they would put them into the main life-saving station. And the survivors would wait there until uh, the steamer from Halifax came to take them back. The people there on the island mostly repaired the, the life houses, the lighthouses, and all the stations. Um, the, there's wild horses on the island, Sable Island horses. There's uh, 200 horses now. Um, there's plenty of food for them. In the summer they fatten up so that in winter they have enough fat to take them over to the next summer. Um, once there was a, the government wanted to sell the horses for glue because they had no idea, or glue or dog food, because they had no idea back then about the life cycle of the horses. They, um, they thought they were going to starve because there was only this much amount of grass on them. So, but all the children from America wrote letters and the government accepted the letters and Prime Minister Deaton Baker protected the horses on June 2nd, 1960 and the law still exists. Hmm. They, um, no one is allowed to feed the horses or interfere with their daily lives. And the horses have lived like that for 230 years now. My name is Felicia Skrin and I did my project on Judik. And this here is Judik's old train station, which I never knew we had. This here is the new hall after they tore down this one. And here. And 
here's the church's tartan, the St. Andrew's Church. This here picture here is the Judic Flyer. There's the church. And here's the Cane Tire Farm. And this picture here it has the church, the priest's hall, and the old hall. This is Glenn Graham. He's the Judic performer. Here it's inside of our church. And if you look down here, you'll see Little Judic, Judic Interval, Judic North, Judic, South Judic, Rear Judic Chapel, Rear Judic South, and Lower Hillsdale, Hillsdale, and St. Ninian. Those are all places around Judic. And here is Bishop McCagran. He is one of our early settlers in Judic. And Michael McDonald was our sea captain. And over here, is a picture, like a picture of the tartan again, but it's and it tells what Judic is today, what it's like than back then. In these pages here, they're of the Judic early settlements and stuff. And if you and down here, like in uh, Saint Ninian and Little Judic, there's schools. And if you go up here to Judic North and you go down the road around there, you'll come to the, old, the old Judic school. Hi, my name is Zena Rankin. I did my project on my family. It's called My Roots Are Showing. I'll show you the object first. This is a painting of my great-grandmother, Margaret Wright. This was done in 1985 by my uncle, Jimmy Rankin. Uh, this is a book that my Aunt Raylene put out just for the family, and it's full of old songs and pictures. There's like just old songs back in the 50s and stuff. And there's pictures like there. Um, this is a picture of my grandmother Kathleen Wright when she was in high school. Um, this is a book of family trees. It's got like all my grand aunts and uncles, like their names and who they married and their children and if their children's children got married and their children and there's the McDonald's, the Wrights, the Rankins and the Clothes. These are CDs that my relatives put out. This one is Jimmy Rankin. These three are the Rankin family which is playing right now. Um, these are Colin, Kyle and Keith and all fired up. They're from Inverness. They just put it out a couple years ago and this is a picture of my my family Rankin family reunion sweater that was back in 1991. There's a picture of the family reunion that's all of her family, Rankin family. Um, this is Alexander, my grandfather, and this is Kathleen Wright, my grandmother. This is David Wright. He's my great great grandfather. And that's my great-grandparents, Hugh McClellan and Margaret Um, I have a poster here of my uncle Jimmy. I just thought I'd bring it in, this poster. This is like the family tree of our, my family. Uh, this is me, Zena Rankin. And this is my parents, Ronald Rankin and Claire McDonald. Claire McDonald's parents were Marcella McClellan and Ernest McDonald. Marcella McClellan's parents were Hugh McClellan and Margaret McClellan. Margaret McClellan's parents were Alexander McClellan and Isabel McClellan. And my and her father, Hugh McClellan's parents were Minnie Gillis and A.R. McClellan. My 
My grandfather, Ernest McDonald, his parents were Colin McDonald and Veronica McDonald. Veronica McDonald's parents were Alan McDonald and a woman, and her last name is McNeil. She died young, so no one knows her name. Colin McDonald's parents were Jesse Kennedy and John McDonald. John McDonald's parents were Jay McLeod and Neil McDonald, and Neil McDonald's parents were Neil McDonald and Emily McMillan. Neil McDonald and Emily McMillan immigrated from Scotland back in the 18, early 1800s. Ronald Rankin's parents were Alexander Rankin and Kathleen Wright. Kathleen Wright's ma uh, mother was Margaret Wright. Uh, I do not know her father's name. Um, Sarah Watts is uh, Margaret's parents and Dave Wright. Sarah Watts was really a McDonald, but she got married to a man named Alonzo Watts of Port Hood. And her parents are John McDonald and Jesse Livingston. Dave Wright's parents are Eliza McDonald and John Wright. Um, John Wright's parents were Lady Henrietta and James Wright. They, Lady Henrietta, James Wright, and John Wright immigrated from Scotland back, or Ireland back in 1813, around then. Uh, John Wright had another sister, but it is said that she, her name was Eliza McDonald uh, Wright, and she stayed with relatives in Ireland. Alexander Rankin's parents were Sarah Cameron and Johnny Rankin. Sarah Cameron is Johnny Rankin's second wife. He first had one wife, and uh, his first wife was her sister. They had two children. It was Alexander Rankin and Margaret uh, Rankin. Uh, Sarah Cameron, uh, her sister, died, and then she married, Johnny Rankin married Sarah Cameron. They had 12 other children. Sarah Cameron's parents are Mary Beaton and John Cameron. John Cameron's parents are Donald Cameron and Catherine Beaton. Donald Cameron's parents are Isabel Beaton and Angus Cameron. And Angus Cameron's parents are Angus Cameron and Mary Beaton. And Angus Cameron and Mary Beaton both immigrated from Scotland. Johnny Rankin's parents are Catherine Beaton and Angus Rankin. Angus Rankin's parents are Eliza McDonald and Finley Rankin and his parents are Catherine Rankin and Angus Rankin. They also immigrated from Scotland. Um, the history of the Rankins, the Wrights, the McDonalds, and the McClellans, that's just a more detailed part, like their grandparents, like if they had brothers and sisters and what they had and stuff. And this is a photo album of pictures I collected from my family. And there's like my family. And there's more pictures of my family. Uh, there's pictures of my father's family. And there's uh, pictures of Margaret Wright. She's my great-great-grandmother. Uh, that's my great-granduncle Danny. And that's my grandmother Kathleen. Um, and there's pictures of more family, and that's my um, my grandfather, Ernest McDonald, and that's Annie Paget, his sister. Um, there's a picture of my grandmother and grandfather's wedding. That's Ernest and Marcella McDonald. And that's my great-grandmother, uh, Margaret McClellan, and those are my cousins. And there's a picture of all my mother's uh, brothers and sisters and parents. And then there's a picture of, that's Sally Rankin, she's my great-grandmother, and that's Margaret uh, Wright, and that's who's in the picture, uh, the painting, and she's my great-grandmother. That's my father and my mother, Ronnie and Claire, and that's Veronica McDonald and Colin McDonald, they're my great-grandparents. And there's more pictures. And that's my project. Hope you enjoyed it.
Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm Jillian Lake Thompson, and I chose to do my project on spinning because it's a very important part of our heritage. Uh, there's four main types of spinning wheels. This is the Saxony wheel. Everything is arranged horizontally, so if you're standing here, your wheel and your spindle and everything will be facing you like this. This is a castle wheel. All the components are arranged vertically above the wheel, so it looks like a castle, basically. A uh, Norwegian wheel looks a lot like the Saxony wheel. It usually has a large wheel and four legs and a horizontal bench. And the modern wheel. This right here is a modern wheel, but it's the modern wheel here looks it's modern looking and a bit tacky, but uh, this is a modern wheel made to look old fashioned like a Saxony wheel. Um, before you can uh, start spinning your yarn or your wool or your fibers, uh, they must be carded. Carding is the process that fluffs up the wool and brushes them out and takes out little pieces of dust and arranges the fibers so you can spin them. And to card, these are hand carders right here. First you get, take your wool and rub it over here just to get all the fibers caught. Brush it and brush it and brush it and brush it. And then, then to take it off, you simply go like this. Like this. And what you have here is called a roll egg. And you can see here all the fibers are all jumbled up. They're sort of like this. They aren't all, all uh, parallel. So these are called roll eggs. I also have some things here, and they're called roll vings. And if you look closely at them, the fibers are all parallel, pretty much. Uh, there's also a machine that's called the drum carter, right here. And all you do is you turn a crankshaft, and there's two, and they, there's two wheels going, and they both have little combs on them. And you you put your wool in there, and it combs it all up for you. Um, one of the first types of spinning that people used to do was called lap spinning. This is hundreds of years ago. But they used to take a piece of wool and give a little twist in it. And then stretch it out. The more spin you put in a fiber, the stronger it is. Now you have a two-ply yarn. This is the very first way of making yarn out of fibers. This is a more advanced method. This is a hand spindle, or a drop spindle. And all you do is you turn this like this to give you your spin. Twist go up. Pull and let the twist go up. This right here is a modern spinning wheel. I'll demonstrate two methods of spinning. One, one is called the long draw technique, and the other is called the, the, the woolen technique and the worsted technique. This right here, what I'm going to do is called the inchworm technique. It's the technique mostly used by beginners, and it's pretty easy. And all you do is you pull and let the twist slide up. Pull and let the twist slide up. It's a, you use worsted, worsted yarn, or uh, rovings to do, to do this. And this type of wool is very strong, so you use it for underwear, socks, Anything that you didn't want to wear out. The other type is the type you use for the roll eggs. And it's called the long draw technique. What you do is you get your fiber up here, put some twist, pull, put some twist.
in two hours you can spin enough wool to knit a pair of mittens. I thought that was kind of interesting. And then after you're, if you're done spinning your uh, yarn or your fiber, uh, you put it on this thing. It's called the Knitty Knotty. You simply wind it around here. And then you can take it off and what you'll have is a skein like this. And then you take the skein twist it a couple times. And you have a nice little skein. Um, wool, wool and cotton aren't the only fibers that can be used for, uh, for spinning. You can also use soft and camel, mohair, which is pretty soft too, silk, linen, uh, cotton, alpaca, goat, and sheep's wool. That. And also other cult cultures which may have other hairy animals, they could use the hair from that. And I think that's basically my project. <laughs>
60 kilometers southeast from Nova Scotia lays what is known to sailors as the graveyard of the Atlantic. Years ago, Sable Island was seen as a fearful place, but today a beautiful place where wild horses roam. Located between Europe and North America, Sable Island is one of the world's richest fishing grounds and natural wonders. A place where hundreds of vessels sail past each year. There have been over 350 recorded shipwrecks since 1583, but very little of the ruins remain. Sometimes only a shoe buckle, a few coins, ship name boards, or t timbers buried in the sand remain. Okay. The weather. Sable Island lies in the path of most storms that track up the Atlantic coast of North America. The storms are treacherous and dangerous to any ship passing by. So Sable Island is the, one of the most foggiest places in the world. It has 125 days of fog a year. Um, the warm air in the summer produces dense banks of fog in the Gulf, storms, Gulf Stream when it hits the cooled air by the lateral current. In 1873, two lighthouses were built, one on the east of Sable Island, the other on the west. Because of erosion, the west lighthouse had to be moved in 1883, 1888, 1917, 1951. A lighthouse keeper had to live on the island to keep the light shining when it was dark. But nowadays, the lighthouses run automatically. Um, on the island, there are houses of refuge. It's for the ships that have wrecked for the people to survive. It includes the heat, the food, water, and directions to the life saving station. Life saving stations were the island's first permanent settlements. They were organized by the humane establishment. Steamer, a steamer would bring food to the stations a few times a year, but some of the food was produced or provided by the island itself. One station alone could not patrol the entire island, so by 1895 there were five stations. The main station provided homes for the sailors until the next steamer from Halifax arrived. The jobs that the people did on the island were maintaining buildings and equipment, hunting ducks and seals for fresh meat, life-saving drills and actual rescues. They also put cranberries to finance the operation. In 1958, after 11 years without a shipwreck, the humane establishment ended. The only people now living on the island are half a dozen weather observers, sometimes with their families, and people who research on horses. A lot of people ask the question, why are there so many wrecks? Well, several things contribute to so many shipwrecks. One of the factors is the fog. Sextants were used by the caps captains to help navigate. They also replied on the sighting of stars in the sun. Fo at, in fog at Sable Island, they were useless. As a, ca as a result, captains used their ship's speed and direction to find their way. The warm winds in August 1926 and 1927 caught a, feet, a fleet of fisher, fishing vessels from Lunenburg in fierce storms. As a result, 138 fishermen were lost. Many came from small communities. Over the years, due to advancement of technology, <clears throat> Sable Island is not, has not been threat, a threat to shipping. The last vessel to re wrecked on Sable Island was in July 27, 1999. The small, it was a small yacht. One of the reasons Sable Island is so famous is for because of its horses. There are 200 wild horses that roam the island today. There's no evidence of how the horses arrived on the island. Some say they were, um, some say they were survivors of a shipwreck, and others say that they were put on the island to graze on it. Um, the horses survive because there's plenty of food for them and fresh water on the island that keeps them alive. Even though in tough winters. Um, the horses eat the grass, that which is very nourishing. They spend most of the summer fattening up so that in the winter they don't need as much food. The horses dig for water in ponds scattered over the island. 
They have a sixth sense, so they'll where to dig. <clears throat> Although in some seasons, the horses have problems finding drinking water. Sand and their teeth. The quartz in the sand grinds down the teeth of the horses. Although after about six, year, six years, after the teeth have stopped growing, some of the horses starve because their worn teeth can't grind the marble grass. And the death rating changes of the horses from year to year. One year it may be really high, and the next it might be low. If the winters are mild, more would survive, but if it's a very harsh winter, then the old, the weak, and the young horses that need a lot of food, um, die. <laughs> and that's our project. <laughs> yes. Um, I was fortunate enough to have my aunt used to live on Sable Island. So we have an interview here with Paula Sutherland, who is a meteorologist. And um, she lived there for two years, and she studied the weather. And she, this is um, shells and sand actually from Sable Island. And these are very rare shells that um, you don't find on every beach shore. And this is a map of all the boats that, and ships that sunk There's about since 1583. There's about 350 or more. And those are pictures that, real pictures that have been taken. Um, by my aunt on Sable Island, and that's a book, and it's all about the horses, and it's signed to my uh, cousin. I have one too, and it's signed actually from the author, and we know her, so. Okay, go. Hi, I'm Amber Miller, and my partner, Jack.